Welcome to worship at Fletcher Hills Presbyterian Church. Wherever you've been this week, wherever you are right now, we are so glad that you have decided to join us for this service of worship. Let's begin with the Psalms. I'd like to begin our worship with Psalm 86, verses 8 through 10. Among the gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. We are here to worship God this morning or this afternoon or this evening, whenever you are watching this videotape service. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, Thank you for welcoming us into this time of worship. May our songs, prayers, and study focus on you and give all of the glory to your name that you so richly deserve. Amen. Let's begin our worship with song. As we enter into our announcement time, I'd like to start with a happy Father's Day to all of the fathers out there. I hope you're able to spend some of your day with your children and dads, we love you. Don't forget that, even though we may not always tell you. Uh, it's great to have you as part of our lives and for all of the guidance, we are so thankful. So happy Father's Day, Dad. Let's get on to the announcements. First thing I'd like to highlight from the weekly update, and I do hope you are tracking on Wednesdays at one o'clock and keeping track of what is announced in the update. First thing, Thursday this week on the 25th at 6 p.m., we will have a Zoom meeting where we will ordain and install our new elders and deacons. A couple of weeks ago as a congregation, we did a Zoom meeting and were able to elect those elders and deacons. So now we will install them and we invite you to be part of that service. It will be at 6 p.m. Thursday, the 25th, and we will send out an announcement a day or two before with the Zoom information that you'll need to join in. And we invite everyone to please be part of that. Second, you may have noticed uh, an article that we are putting together some drop-in opportunities for our congregation. We got some really good feedback about the ability to see each other at that congregational meeting and so we have come up with a couple of ways that we can get together even though we are not able to be together as a full congregation. We are starting something that we are calling Patio Live and Patio Zoom. 
and each week we will offer an opportunity for a virtual get-together and a live in-person get-together. And these will begin this week. On Monday, Kevin will host a Zoom drop-in. Um, we will send you an email with the Zoom information that you'll need to be part of that. But Kevin would love to meet you if you would like to drop in from noon until 1 on Monday. Later in the week on Tuesday, we'll offer a live get-together on campus. I will be hosting that from 5.30 until 6.30 p.m. We will get together Tuesday on the patio and we will observe masks, wearing, and social distancing. So if you would like to get together face to face within those parameters that we believe are still safe, bring a chair, bring a drink if you would like to have one, bring your dinner if you're going to ha have dinner or stop on your way home from work and just drop in and say hello. There is no agenda for this patio Zoom or this patio live get together. And we will publish and offer one of each each week. So be tuned to that as we publish the, uh, the schedule in the weekly update. And we'll send out a little reminder um, later today so that you will be able to know the Zoom information and the schedule for this week. You also might have noticed a new column in the weekly update on conversations on racism. This is a topic that is going to be around for a while and we all need to engage in it. We need to educate ourselves. We need to look at our own backgrounds and our own perspectives here. And it is the hope of staff that as we sort through so much of what's out there, we can offer to you each week another place to learn or to listen to a provocative idea that you may not have considered before or learn how to engage in a conversation about racism. So this week's option is a four-part series that Reverend Carla Shaw is offering during the month of June. She is the pastor at Point Loma Community Presbyterian. So you'll find the links in this particular article each week, and they will be different each week with different formats and different subjects around racism. So we encourage you to drop into those and to see what is out there and to engage this conversation as we move forward and also into session three of our small groups. You may have noticed that we, our mission committee has given a gift to Children of the Nations, $2,500 to help them fund a full-time nurse in the community of Bellevue in Haiti. This gift is possible through your generous continued giving to the general fund. And this is a need in Haiti that we have known about and we are now able to help with that. It is not her entire salary, but it is a good start. And we are hopeful that Ms. Magali, who has been volunteering for two years in that community as a nurse, is now able to be on full time and to be available to this community, particularly during the time of COVID-19 in Haiti. So thank you for your continued giving that allows us to bless our mission partners and to make a difference um, in places that we can't be right now. Lastly, I'll just say thank you for your continued giving in all ways, whether it's online, sending a check, or whether it's having your bank send um, your donation each month. We really appreciate your continued faithfulness in this. It helps our staff, it helps us to continue the programs that we have here, and we are very thankful for your giving. That's it for the announcements. Again, keep track of them in the weekly update, Wednesdays about one o'clock. Let's move on with our worship service. Good morning, kids. Uh, before we jump into what we are going to talk about this morning, I have something very special to show you all. So here you go. Hello. Uh, in this video, I just wanted to quickly recognize a few very special people. The people I want to recognize right now are those who are moving up, being promoted, and have graduated. Um, so 
We'll start with our youngest and move up to our oldest and go in alphabetical order. So first up, from moving on from fifth grade into sixth grade, we have Lily Bindal Jalil and Ellie Miller. And I am so excited for you guys um, to move into our student ministries and get to come to youth group and just get to know you better. So that's it for our elementary school kids moving up into sixth grade. Now let's move on to our junior hires who have just finished their eighth grade year and will be starting high school in the fall. Going in alphabetical order, first we have Lily Boing Gross. Next we have Zoe Cable. Third we have Brianna Schoner. And lastly we have Sydney Swanson. These girls are so amazing and so funny and so sweet and it's been a joy having you in our junior high ministry and I cannot wait to see what you will do and accomplish in high school. And last but not least, we have our high school seniors who have just graduated and will be moving on to new and exciting adventures. First up, we have Nico Cotto, who has graduated from Patrick Henry High School and will be moving on to attending the UC Irvine School of Music to continue his drumming career. He hopes and plans to one day become a gigging, recording, and teaching musician. And on top of all that, he also wants to discover, are birds actually real? And I got a special note that his big brother, Chris Cotto, is extremely proud of him. Next, we have Trinity Ellis. She has graduated and has even already begun taking classes at Grossmont College this last semester. She will continue on at Grossmont College for two years before transferring on, and she plans to study psychology and hopes to one day be a psychologist and therapist. She just loves helping people as much as she can. And finally, also graduating from Patrick Henry High School, we have Audrey Waters, who will in the fall be attending CSU Fullerton, and is planning to study graphic design. Again, we are so proud of all of you guys, and I know in my heart that you will continue to do amazing things in this world. Congratulations again to everyone. It is such a joy to see you moving on in these different new exciting stages of your life. And welcome back, I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, we are so proud of you graduates. Now, one other thing before we get to what we're talking about. This weekend is Father's Day, and we just want to say we are so thankful to all the fathers and the father figures out there who are raising up this next generation. Um, we just thank you for all the work you do, for the examples that you've set us. We are so grateful for you. Now, today, I don't have my most favoritist box, because that's at church right now, but I do have this. And what's inside this, you might ask? Oh, good question. Inside this, I have chocolate chip cookies that I baked earlier this week. Chocolate chip cookies are so good. Raise your hand if you like chocolate chip cookies. What's your favorite kind of cookie? That's a good one, that's a good one. Now, I love chocolate chip cookies, but in order to make them, you have to start with a bunch of ingredients. And the ingredients by themselves aren't very good necessarily, right? You have to get some raw eggs and some flour and some sugar. And sugar is good, but not plain. It's, uh, it's too much, too sweet. You need other stuff. Then you put in the chocolate chips. And once it's all in there, is it ready to put in the oven? No, you gotta mix it up. And it might even seem kind of violent, like how much is getting mixed up and tossed around and stirred up, right? It, it's a lot of work and it, and it can make a mess even, right? It gets kind of messy. But once it's all together and it's all clumpy, then is it ready to go? No, you gotta, you gotta heat it up. You gotta put it in the oven and you gotta get the oven at like 350 degrees. Think about how hot that is. When it gets like 85 outside, I'm like, whew, but we gotta put this in 350 degrees, a very hot 
high temperature, something that could burn you. And if you leave it in there too long, the cookies will get burnt, right? But if you leave them in there for just the right amount of time, like 12, 13, 14 minutes, right? The perfect amount of time. And then you pull those bad boys out. Ooh, they're so good. And then right when you pull them out, you can just eat them, right? No, you gotta wait. They gotta cool off a little bit. Otherwise, they're gonna burn your hands and burn your mouth and they're gonna be too gooey and just fall apart. You let them cool off a little bit, right? You let it settle and then you scrape it off and eat a delicious chocolate chip cookie. Now, why am I talking about cookies? Well, because I love them, but also in the world, when things are changing, right? We're living in a world where things are always changing. A lot of times when we're in the middle of the change, it's not, doesn't feel so great, right? Like we, maybe we have all these ingredients and we don't know what they're all for. And when they're all by themselves, they don't actually taste that good or seem like they're that important but then they get all mixed together and that, that just makes a big mess. And then they get all stirred around, like things in the world can feel crazy sometimes. And we don't know what is happening, what is happening. Change is hard. It gets all mixed up and we feel confused when things are changing. But what, can, what we can remember, what we can hold on to when things are scary and changing and everything around us feels like we don't know what's happening. What we can hold on to is that we are making something better, right? Like with the cookies, you do all that work, you mix it all up, and then you even put it in the oven under a high temperature, but you're doing all that to make something so good, so delicious, right? And so sometimes when we look in the world, or sometimes even for our graduates, like your life is going to change. All of that can feel scary sometimes, and we don't know what's happening, but we can hold on to and remember that God is making something good, and we get to be a part of that. How exciting is that? That we get to be a part of the good thing that God is making. So I just wanted to talk about that with you this morning. I hope you all are having a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you soon. Goodbye.
Do you remember the day of your baptism? Do you remember the day that you were presented for the sacrament of Christian baptism? I don't remember the day, but I do know the date, and I do have photographic evidence. My baptism took place December 12, 1971, when I was just 21 days old. My mom and dad were a part of a local Lutheran church, and so it was their tradition to participate in infant baptism. They presented me, and I was given that blessing of baptism that has been celebrated for thousands of years in the church. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about baptism, and maybe a fuller understanding of baptism than you may have had up until this point. Our text is Romans chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. So I invite you now to open in your Bible to Romans 6, or to open in your tablet, or your uh, Bible app on your phone, whatever you plan to use, to Romans chapter 6, and I'll read for us now verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Very obviously, something profound takes place with this sacrament of baptism. And for some of us who were baptized when we were infants, even though we weren't participants, or I should say deciding participants in that celebration, something profound was taking place. And we usually associate baptism with a celebration in the church. Either it's using the baptismal font like we have here in our sanctuary at Fletcher Hills or Easter Sunday where we're outside doing baptism by immersion. People typically wear really nice clothes and family members are invited to come and be a part because we're celebrating new life. But we don't often talk about the fact that we're also celebrating death when we celebrate baptism. You can hear it in the Apostle Paul's words. Death needs to happen before resurrection and life can be considered. And so in a very real way, when we are baptized, we are supposed to realize that we are dying. It's a death. Paul says we are baptized into Jesus' death. Some scholars have said it's literally a drowning That's what baptism is supposed to symbolize for us, is a drowning. The old self dies so that the new self can live. And some scholars talk about the fact that we join Jesus in the tomb. And we can't skip over that part. We have to die so that we can be raised again alongside Jesus. And it really does have to do with resurrection. First comes the death, then comes the resurrection. And when Jesus rose from the grave 2,000 years ago, that showed us not only that he could conquer sin and death, but that we too would be able to because of his work inside of us. All of these things are celebrated in baptism. And baptism is many things. It's not just the ceremony that we conduct in the sanctuary or when we do the immersions on Easter Sunday. Baptism is first and foremost a sacrament. We recognize it as a sacrament in the church. And so we always say to people when they're joining in membership or becoming a part of the fellowship, have you been baptized? It's not legalistic. It's just something that's central to our participation in the church. And so we always want to make sure that there is a chance 
for somebody to stand and say, yes, I believe, or for parents to be able to stand and say, yes, we believe, and we'll lead this child to know Christ. We want that sacrament to be something that's very real to people who are participants in our church. But baptism is more than a sacrament. It's also an initiation. It's an initiation into a brand new life. What's become really clear when you look at Paul's teaching about baptism in Romans 6 is it's, he's not just talking about a ceremony in church. He's talking about a life revolution, everything changing, everything being different on the other side, and there's no going back because death and then resurrection have brought that transformation that simply cannot be undone. Once you've been baptized, you can never be unbaptized. You might renounce your baptism or walk away from the faith, but you'll never be unbaptized. So Paul's not just talking about a sacrament or a ceremony. Paul's also talking about an initiation into the life of Christianity, into being a believer in Christ and living life in a very different way. And that's the third thing that baptism symbolizes, is a life that is transformed and changed. Paul says, you are dead to sin and you are alive to God. So When we get on the other side of baptism, the idea is that the temptation of sin, the allure of sin begins to fade away. And that this alive to God means that God's work is ready to begin in us. That we are drawn to the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Christianity. And we want those to inform and guide every step of our life from now on. So baptism's a sacrament. But it's also an initiation into a new life, and it's also a day-to-day life. Every single day when I wake up, I live out my baptism when I choose to follow after Jesus. But there's even more to baptism. I've been thinking a lot about this this week. There's the personal uh, side of baptism that we've been talking about, that sacrament that you receive, your initiation into the Christian faith, and then your ongoing life, your day-by-day choice to live after the followings of Jesus. That's the personal realm, the personal dynamic of baptism. Something dies, something new comes to life within you personally. And then we in the Reformed Church, in the Presbyterian Church, we believe there's a communal element, a communal facet to the baptism. We call it covenant theology. And so if you've been around our church for long, you know that when parents come to present a child for baptism, it's something we always do in the course of one of our regular worship services. That's because the congregation is required, the household of faith, brothers and sisters in Christ, the faith family, they are required. This is not something that we do in a church office. It's not something that we do in somebody's home privately. It's something that requires the church to stand and say, yes, we commit ourselves to this family and we commit ourselves to this child. We want to walk alongside them and resource them and help them and encourage them every step of the way. We want this child, as they grow, to come to know Jesus. And so there's this beautiful communal dimension to baptism that we can't ignore. It's not just a personal thing, but also a communal thing. But you know, this week I've been thinking even further into this. And I've decided that I think there's a societal edge to baptism or facet to baptism as well. There's a time when something dies in society to make room for resurrection, to make room for transformation and change. And I think that's exactly what is happening in our world today. Think about it for a moment. COVID-19, the pandemic hit three to four months ago. And everything changed for all of us. All of our life rhythms, all of the plans that we had for vacation, our jobs, our schooling, every aspect of our life was transformed without our permission. And you could say that all of those things died. All of those things died. The question becomes, after those things die, what comes next? What's the resurrection look like? What's the transformation look like? I know for many of us, we keep saying, I want to get back to the new normal or back to normal like it was, or I I, I want the good old days to come back. I really wish it was like it was before. But in baptism, you don't go back. The old thing has died. And I think when it comes to COVID-19 and the pandemic, the old thing that has died for many of us is this idea that we're in control. 
This idea that we can plan each new day, this idea that we have control over our health or we're impervious to these things, this idea that, that we're the ones in charge, that evaporated early on during COVID-19 as we realized we needed to follow new restrictions, we needed to connect with God and trust in God in new ways. So the resurrection was this realization that we're not in charge, but the one who is in charge is the one we can follow after in the midst of it. That's a baptism, a baptism societally that's come through what's happening in the world around us. And I think the second element of baptism that we see at work in our world today is this systemic racism that's come to light in the last several weeks. I know we talked about it last week, and I know there were a few people who expressed concerns with me talking about Black Lives Matter and not emphasizing all lives matter. I want to say really clearly that all lives do matter. Scripture is incredibly clear. Genesis is saying that all of us have the omago Dei, the image of God inside of us. We're not saying that all lives don't matter, but what we are saying is that in the same way that Jesus at times emphasized certain people groups, like Samaritans, when he told his story about the rescue along that road, Jesus emphasized certain people in certain seasons because they were the ones in need of help. And that's exactly, I think, what's happening in our culture today. There's this baptism, this death to an old way of living, a privileged way for many of us that we weren't really aware of, that we weren't really we realized that we were benefiting from so much. And in place of that death comes resurrection with Christ, renewed ideas, renewed understanding, and the resulting change of life, the transformation that baptism symbolizes. And so baptism runs deep. It's our personal confession of faith and participation in the sacrament. It's the communal connection to a household of faith, to a faith family, where where we stand with one another and commit to support each other. But I also think the rhythms of this world, most notably COVID-19 and systemic racism being revealed, are also baptism. Things are being put to death in this world so that resurrection can take their place, and you and I have a chance to be a part of it. Now, of course, we could resist it if we wanted to. We could pretend that uh, it's not really happening or, or we don't have any lessons to learn or we've arrived already. But, but I think if we began talking that way, Paul would use his line from the beginning of this morning's passage. He would say, by no means, don't fall for that trap. Be teachable, be soft, be malleable in the hands of God. And look at this world and see what is it that the world can teach me what death needs to happen inside of me what death needs to happen in our society that can make room for the resurrection and new life that jesus brings friends we have been baptized into a brand new reality our world will never be the same We can spend the rest of our lives lamenting that and trying to claw our way back to what was. Or we can throw ourselves at the mercy of our living and loving God and say, show me what transformation looks like. Show me what to think. Show me what to believe. And show me how to live so that I participate not just in death, but I participate in the power of resurrection. Let's accept nothing less. I invite, to jo- invite you to join me on this journey of searching out what our personal, our communal, and our societal transformation looks like as we've been baptized into the life of Christ. Amen. Well, Paul's good word about baptism and the reality of resurrection for those who choose to trust in Christ very naturally leads us to the table. This meal that we have a chance to celebrate every time we worship is a reminder of the new life that we have in Christ and a reminder that we are invited to the table, that we have a seat at the table, not because we've earned it, but because God has worked transformation within us and because the grace of Christ reaches to everyone, inviting them to taste and see that God is good. And so if you haven't already prepared your communion elements, now's a great time to pause the video just for a moment and to pull together whatever bread and whatever juice or liquid that you have in your home. Our book of order is very clear that you just use the elements that are available to you in your natural space and they become 
the communion meal. So grab those supplies as we remember together that first communion meal. On that night, Jesus gathered with his disciples in a borrowed upper room. And as they sat down to the meal, Jesus took the bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it and said to those with him, This is my body, which is for you. Do this whenever you do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal that evening, Jesus took the cup. And after he poured it, he said to those with him, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. The scriptures teach us that whenever we eat of this bread or drink of this cup, we declare Jesus' death until he comes again. And so this meal is a celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection, a celebration of the impact of that resurrection on our lives, and also a celebration of kingdom come, a world transformed in the power of Christ. And so if you would, join me now. Taking a piece of the bread, this is Christ's body broken for you. And some of the juice, realizing this is Christ's blood shed for you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace at work in our lives, your grace at work in our world, your grace at work in our faith family here at Fletcher Hills. We thank you for the gift of this sacrament, a Passover meal transformed as a reminder once and for all that we are saved by grace, welcomed by grace, transformed by grace. We celebrate our baptism into you, that transformation that you began and that you continue to do each day within us as we live out our baptism in this world. And so thank you for grace. Thank you for this taste of grace. May it continue to work transformation in each of our souls. I pray this now in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
pray with me. God, right now, we lift up Ray Pekruel and ask that his surgery goes so smoothly next week and that his recovery goes quickly and easily and that he can get back to enjoying his normal life soon. We thank you for the doctors who are practiced and skilled enough to help Ray through this difficult time. We also lift up Daniel Kingsbury, and we ask that the doctors would have the wisdom to determine the best course of treatment so that Daniel may be quickly and fully healed. We also pray for peace during this time of unknown for he and his family. We pray for Avery Mancuso, that as she enters into treatment, she would be open to receiving the help being offered to her and to trust and know how deeply she is loved through this entire process. And we pray for strength and resilience for her and also her family as they are on this journey through this with her. That as they support and encourage Avery, the Mancusos would also know that they are loved and supported. And finally, I ask God that you would bring peace to our country and not a cheap, easy, false peace that comes from ignoring problems, but true peace where people feel safe and that they are at home by working through difficulties and conflicts, by bringing justice, mercy, and love to where it is needed. Give us all ears to hear and eyes to see our neighbors around us who need us to be there for them. And may we be brave and willing to do the local work necessary to bring healing to our country. Now, let us pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this weekend worship experience. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.